is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the lives of Christopher Chant, Chronicles of Crestomancy, Book Two, by Diana Wynne Jones. Chapters one, two, and I believe three and four. Yes. In these chapters, a young man named Christopher discovers that he has some powers that are pretty valuable to a certain somebody, and this poor kid is so eager to be cared about by any adult that the first person to take an interest, I think we can all agree, is bad news, but the kid doesn't seem to know that. It's hard to watch. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Many, many, many thanks to Patricia for commissioning this episode. I'm really excited because this book I thought was going to be because, you know, it says the lives of Christopher Chant and Cat is named Christopher, if I'm not mistaken, right? In uh, Charmed Life. So I thought that this was going to be a continuation of his story. But then the book begins with a little... um like blurb that just, or it says note. Everything in this book happens at least 25 years before the story told in Charmed Life. So it's basically a prequel. And I know that prequels get a lot of shit nowadays because they get that shit totally fairly, I may add, because of Hollywood's propensity for recycling old ideas rather than coming up with something that's fresh and new. And they try and pretend that it's something fresh and new by having it be a different story told with characters that we're all familiar with. So what they'll do is they'll have a very successful blockbuster movie of some kind. And then rather than continue to, you know, create new worlds like that, they decide that they're going to try and drive that into the ground and create a prequel that nobody wanted or asked for. And that is something that I understand people's frustration with. But I myself have always been a massive fan of prequels, especially books, because it always feels to me like authors have this whole idea that they had when they were writing the book or like the first one that they didn't include because they felt like, well, this is the other story that I want to tell. But there's a feeling of almost indulgence in prequels a lot of the time, like the author is finally getting to share with us something that they wanted us to know and didn't have time or space in the original story to really get into. So there's, there's, a feeling of almost intimacy to me when I read prequels a lot of the time, because it just feels like the author getting to do something simply because they're excited to share it rather than because they, you know what I mean? And that may be misplaced. It might not be valid at all, but that's how I've always felt about it. So when I saw that this starts before I got really happy and I was already excited to read it. But, um, so we start off, With chapter one, the first line is, it was years before Christopher told anyone about his dreams. This was because he mostly lived in the nurseries at the top of the big London house, and the nursery maids who looked after him changed every few months. He scarcely saw his parents. When Christopher was small, he was terrified that he would meet Papa out walking in the park one day and not recognize him. He used to kneel down and look through the banisters on the rare days when Papa came home from the city before bedtime, hoping to fix Papa's face in his mind. Now, okay, here's something. We have talked to... Oh, Patricia's here. Hi, Patricia. Um, Many thanks for this, Patricia. Um, Patricia and I have uh, briefly chatted about the fact that Diana Wynne-Jones tends to write about neglected children 
a lot of the time. Children whom people have forgotten about or whom people don't think are of any consequence. And this particular phenomenon that's being described here, the idea of like being worried that you won't even recognize your own parent. Um, I have mentioned a few times how neglected my fiance was and he actually has experienced this. He was grocery shopping and he ran into his mother and she did not recognize him and he did not say anything to her. He chose to let her not recognize him because he didn't want to talk to her, but it was such an upsetting moment. I was with him at the time. Like I was dating him when it happened. And, uh, so people can talk about this sort of thing as if it's a hypothetical and be like, wouldn't that be crazy? But this shit is real. It happens. And as much as he was like slightly relieved to not have to interact with his mother at that moment, because he just didn't want to go through that emotional labor. Of course it fucked him up that she didn't even know who he was to look at him, you know, like Jesus Christ. So this child is in a different way neglected than some of the others that we've seen because we have in um fire and hemlock uh we have our main character there who is neglected because her father is incredibly selfish and just bailed on her and her mother definitely has some sort of like actual personality disorder rather whether it be just like straight up narcissism there's some sort of also i would think like um paranoia happening in the last book in charmed life um there's the neglect due to their parents having passed away and his sister being the one that seems to have all of the talent so it's a lot of people who are opportunists and predators in a way kind of looking for kids that are going to profit them in some way to take care of rather than doing it for the sake of the kids and um what do you call it in in Dark Lord of Durkholm, that's like one of the few times that we actually get a pretty, like, decent family situation. But then towards the end, we find out that there was like a setup from one of the main characters in that to kill his son, whom he didn't want to inherit. So while it's not a main character that's experiencing it in that book, we definitely still have shades of, of bad parenting and people who don't care about their kids. Um, so... This character, Christopher, he's cared for in in that he is provided with a home and he's raised by, you know, governesses and given food. And it's not like uh, the way that we can think of neglect sometimes where it's just somebody being left to their own devices entirely. But there's no, like, personal connection with anybody. And the governesses all are so fucking sick of his parents by, the like, a month or so into their job that he never really gets to know any of them. And that's the part that I think is really tough is that a lot of times I feel like this would have to happen because if you are this bad a person that you basically never, ever interact with your child – except for when you are forced to by some sort of circumstance. If you're this bad a parent, then you're probably also just a bad person. And working for people like that is going to be really draining. And I feel like it would be even more draining if you actually cared about the kid. We don't really get an inclination or an, an indication that any of these governesses that he has had really connected with him in any particular way. But the thing is that he doesn't try to connect with any of them because he is so used to being put off to the side and seen as a burden that he isn't interested in like making himself vulnerable and putting himself out there to make a connection with somebody that he knows very well is going to be gone in a couple of weeks. Like why would he? So it's a terrible sort of like self-fulfilling prophecy, the way that this goes. Um, and we get this one scene that's really just like, Ron told me to tell Parvati, like the whole thing. In um, Papa, let's see. Papa was taller than most footmen and Christopher knew little else. 
Some evenings, Mama was on the stairs to meet Papa, blocking Christopher's view with wide silk skirts and a multitude of frills and draperies. "'Remind your master,' she would say icily to the footman, "'that there is a reception in this house tonight, and that he is required for once in his life to act as host.' Papa, hidden behind Mama's wide clothing, would reply in a deeply gloomy voice, "'Tell Madam I have a great deal of work tonight brought home from the office. Tell her she should have warned me in advance.' "'Inform your master,' Mama would reply to the footman, "'that if I'd warned him, he would have found an excuse not to be here.' point out to him that it is my money that finances his business, and that I shall remove it if he does not do this small thing for me. Then Papa would sigh, Tell Madam I am going up to dress. Under protest. Ask her to stand aside from the stairs. Mama never did stand aside to Christopher's disappointment. She always gathered up her skirts and sailed upstairs ahead of Papa to make sure Papa did as she wanted. Mama had huge, lustrous eyes, a perfect figure, and piles of glossy black curls. The nursery maids told Christopher Mama was a beauty. At this stage in his life, Christopher thought everyone's parents were like this. But he did wish Mama would give him a view of Papa just once. He thought everyone had the kinds of dreams he had, too. So I really like this start, the fact that there's like so many strange things about the way he's being raised and the way he experiences the world, but because he is completely isolated from other people and other children, he has no point of reference for how completely dysfunctional that relationship is and how totally unusual his dreams are. He is going into dreams and coming out with stuff that he like brought back with him. So obviously this is more than dreams. Um, the dreams always began the same way. Christopher got out of bed and walked around the corner of the night nursery wall, the part with the fireplace, which jutted out, onto a rocky path high on the side of a valley. The valley was green and steep, with a stream rushing from waterfall to waterfall down the middle, but Christopher never felt there was much point in following the stream down the valley. Instead, he went up the path around a large rock into the part he always thought of as the place between. Christopher thought it was probably a leftover piece of the world from before somebody came along and made the world properly. Formless slopes of rock towered and slanted in all directions. Some of it was hard and steep, some of it piled and rubbly, and none of it had much shape, nor did it have much color. Most of it was the ugly brown you get for mixing every color in a paint box. There was always a formless wet mist hanging around this place, adding to the vagueness of everything. You could never see the sky. In fact, Christopher sometimes thought there might not be a sky. He had an idea that the formless rock went on and on and on in a great arch overhead, but when he thought about it, that did not seem possible. Christopher always knew in his dream that you could get to almost anywhere from the place between. He called it almost anywhere, because there was one place that did not want you to go to it. It was quite near, but he always found himself avoiding it. He set off sliding, scrambling, edging along the bulging wet rock, and climbing up or down, until he found another valley and another path. There were hundreds of them. He called them the Anywheres. The Anywheres were mostly quite different from London. They were hotter or colder, with strange trees and stranger houses. Sometimes the people in them looked ordinary, sometimes their skin was bluish or reddish, and their eyes were peculiar, but they were always very kind to Christopher. He had a new adventure every time he went on a dream. In the active adventures, people helped him escape through cellars of odd buildings, or he helped them in wars or in rounding up dangerous animals. In the calm adventures, he got new things to eat, and people gave him toys. He lost most of the toys as he was scrambling back home over the rocks, but he did manage to bring back the shiny shell necklace the silly ladies gave him because he could hang it around his neck. He went to the anywhere with the silly ladies several times. It had blue sea and white sand, perfect for digging and building in. There were ordinary people in it, but Christopher only saw them in the distance. The silly ladies came and sat out on rocks out of the sea and giggled at him while he made sand castles. 
Oh, Clistopher, they would coo in lisping voices. Tell us what makes you a Clistopher. And they would all burst into screams of high laughter. They were the only ladies he had seen without clothes on. Their skins were greenish, and so was their hair. He was fascinated by the way the ends of them were big silvery tails that could curl and flip almost like a fish could, and send powerful sprays of water over him from their big finned feet. He could never persuade them that he was not a strange animal called a Clistopher. So, this is a really wild beginning. This isn't a kid that is discovering that he can do this as we're reading. This is a kid that once we start this, he has figured this out and does it all the time, which is a really like kind of fun way to just sneak past the boring, like, oh, I can't believe it. When we as readers are like, yeah, believe it. We know that you can do this. And I am so curious about so much. Like, is, is the author saying that all mermaids have lisps is that what's happening here and why are they laughing at this joke that's not really a joke it's such a weird thing um and he gets it in his head that because these silly ladies have like fish tails that all women must have fish tails and it isn't until like way later when he's at a party and he like gets on the ground and like sneaks under a woman's skirts that he finds out that women have legs just like he has legs and he's really bummed out by it which is just sort of amazing i don't know why i really enjoyed that but it just i think it's because it felt so like childlike it, like in its honesty that yeah kids get weird ideas in their heads that they sort of fixate on, that there's no reason why they believe the thing. They just, you know, nobody's told them anything otherwise. I maintained until I was probably like 10. I was old enough that I really should have known better that Pennsylvania was a town that specialized in making pencils and that they had a giant pencil statue in the center of their, like, you know, capital. And I 100% thought that shit was like, it wasn't, nobody told me that. Nobody said that that was how it, I just heard the name and decided, well, that's what this must mean. And then for some reason, took it as gospel and was like, yep, that sounds right. And completely was shocked the first time I ever went to Pennsylvania and there was no pencil statue. And, it, you know, I didn't, did I have a clear idea of where in Pennsylvania, that statue was supposed to be? No, not really. But I assumed that once I got there, I would see it and I would know. And I'll never forget how like disappointed I was that not only did that statue not exist, but there was a what was clearly like a drugstore. But all it said on it, it was just a sign that said drugs. And I remember being like, totally scandalized that a drug dealer just had a huge sign that said drugs and nobody was arresting him. That's the kind of child's brain that I had. So honestly, the fact that Christopher believes what he believes is not at all surprising considering that he can do what he does. I had no such like excuse of actually being able to do fantastical things to fall back on to explain why I believed some of the weirdness that I did. But Christopher is like doing supernatural shit every day. So his understanding of the world is of course going to be colored by that. Um, so I love this line as well. He's, you know, finds out that all women have regular legs because he like basically completely misbehaves at a party that was a huge deal for his mother. And he kind of ruins it for her because she was trying to set up like uh, an inroad into society with this one particular woman who is very important. Um, and as his mother's yelling at him about how disappointed she is, he's thinking about, it says it was very hard work. Christopher realized being a beauty. Mama was very busy in front of her mirror with all sorts of little cut glass bottles and jars behind her. A maid was even busier, far busier than the nursery maids ever were working on mama's glossy curls. Christopher was so ashamed to have wasted all this work that he picked up a glass jar to hide his confusion. 
Um, money isn't everything, you see, Christopher. A good place in society is worth far more. L Lady Badgett could have helped us both. Why do you think I married your papa? Since Christopher had simply no idea what could have brought Mama and Papa together, he put his hand out to pick up the jar again, but remembered just in time he was not supposed to touch it, and picked up a big pad of false hair instead. So he finally asks her, what is this, as he's like messing around with this pad of false hair? And she tells him, and he uh, says, I thought it might be a dead rat. And somehow Mama must have made a mistake, because to Christopher's great interest, the thing really was a dead rat. Mama and her maid both screamed. Christopher was hustled away while a footman came running with a shuffle. After that, Mama called Christopher to her dressing room and talked to him quite often. So yeah, he made, he demonstrates this weird magical ability of being able to like just make something so because he said, and his mother starts to suddenly take an interest in him because she realizes that maybe this kid is her key to society because he's able to do things. Um, he understood Mama cared very urgently about his future. He knew he was going to have to enter society with the best people, but the only society he had heard of was the Aid the Heathen Society that he had to give a penny to every Sunday in church, and he thought Mama meant that. Christopher made careful inquiries from the nursery maid with, his, with the big feet. She told him heathens were savages who ate people. Missionaries were the best people, and they were the ones heathens ate. Christopher saw he was going to be a missionary when he grew up. He found Mama's talk increasingly alarming. He wished she had chosen another career for him. Um, so, yeah, this... Oh, Patricia's saying, You think? I didn't think she knew he had power. Hmm, that's interesting, because I assumed that the fact that she started calling him in more often was directly related to the fact that he had just done that. But I guess we'll see. Um... Christopher knew mermaids were not real because he only met them in dreams. Now he was convinced that he would meet heathens too if he went to the wrong almost nowhere. Um, so he starts to like be a little bit more careful about the, the anywheres that he goes to and checks up on them before he like strolls on in because he starts to get a little concerned about where he winds up. But after a while, when nobody tried to eat him, he decided that the heathens probably lived in the anywhere which stopped you going to it and gave up worrying until he was older. So I'm super curious about that. The anywhere that stopped you going to it. Really, really curious about that one. Um, when he was a little older, people in the anywheres sometimes gave him money. Christopher learned to refuse coins. As soon as he touched them, everything just stopped. He landed in bed with a jolt and woke up sweating. Once this happened when a pretty lady who reminded him of Mama tried laughingly to hang an earring in his ear. Christopher would have asked the nursery maid with big feet about it, but she had left long ago. So I'm wondering if that's connected to, um, you know, the Crestomancy from the last book from Charmed Life has said that he had basically what amounted to a magical allergy to silver. And it sounds like... He touches anything made of silver and everything just completely. But there's also like, I don't think this is the same person because he describes having been like everybody being pretty much sure that he didn't even have magic because they didn't know about this magical allergy. And it seems pretty clear here that Christopher has a handle on that magic somewhat. So... You know, that might be connected, it might not, but I'm going to go with that it probably is. Um, so eventually, it gets to the point that all of his maidservants and whatnot are really, like, bouncing. Like, really, completely... Uh, they're, they're, they're reaching a point of maximum saturation. Um... Patricia says, but does he know it's magic? He just thinks it's dreams. I don't think he does as a kid. But later on, once it's like, once they're doing the experiments, it seems like he knows that this is, you know, the way that what's his face is reacting. It seems like he realizes that this is unusual and that he has like the ability to do something other people can't. Um, 
But all of this is determined on sort of like, I feel like this is the sort of thing that until he's older and we look back at it, I won't have a good idea of what he thought of this. Um, the reason seemed to be that Mama and Papa had given up speaking to one another even through the footman. They handed the servants notes to give one another instead. Since it never occurred to either Mama or Papa to seal the notes, sooner or later someone would bring the note up to the nursery floor and read it aloud to the nursery maid. Christopher learned that Mama was always short and to the point. Mr. Chant is requested to smoke cigars only in his own room, or... Will Mr. Chant please take note that the new laundry maid has complained of holes burned in his short shirts? Or, Mr. Chant caused me much embarrassment by leaving in the middle of my breakfast party. Papa usually left the notes, let the notes build up and then answered them in a kind of rambling rage. My dear Miranda, I shall smoke where I please, and it is the job of that lazy laundry maid to deal with the results. But then your extravagance in employing foolish layabouts and rude louts is only for your own selfish comfort and never for mine. If you wish me to remain at your parties, try to employ a cook who knows bacon from old shoes, and refrain from giving that idiotic tinkling laugh all the time. Well, damn. Okay, Papa. Um, and his replies, as it says usually cause the servants to leave overnight, which is kind of funny. Like his replies cause them to leave because he's just being like harsh with the mistress of the house. But I guess they assume that when his replies are that harsh, that life is about to get really ugly for them and they just want to cut their losses. Um, so finally it comes time for, for our dear Christopher to decide that he's going to, uh, it's time for him to have a governess to switch over from being to having a nursemaid to actually just getting an education. But his mother does not agree with the kind of schooling that his father wants him to have. Um, Christopher realized that the governess was his first step toward becoming a missionary. He felt solemn and alarmed, but when she arrived, the governess was a, a simply a drab lady with pink eyes who was far too discreet to talk with servants. She only stayed a month to Mama's jubilation. Now we can really start your education. I shall choose the next governess myself. Mama said that quite often over the next two years, for governesses came and went just like nursery maids. They were all drab, discreet ladies, and Christopher got their names muddled up. He decided that the chief difference between a governess and a nursery maid was that a governess usually burst into tears before she left, and that was the only time a governess ever said anything interesting about Mama and Papa. "'I'm sorry to do this to you,' the third or maybe fourth governess wept, "'because you're a nice little boy, even if you are a bit remote, but the atmosphere in this house! Every night he's home, which, thank God, is rarely, I have to sit at the dining table with him in utter silence, and she passes me a note to give to him, or he passes me one for her, and then they open the notes and da look daggers at one another, and then at me. I can't stand any more. The ninth, or maybe the tenth, was even more indiscreet. I know they hate one another, she sobbed, but she's no call to hate me, too. She's one of those who can't abide other women, and she's a sorceress, I think. I can't be sure, because she only does little things, and he's at least as strong as she is. He may even be an enchanter. Between them, they make such an atmosphere, it's no wonder they can't keep any servants. Oh, Christopher, forgive me for talking like this about your parents. So, yeah, that sucks. Sorry, Christopher. <laughs> So finally, we go into chapter two when Christopher meets a new governess and she is looking just about the same as the others, similarly drab and just completely uninteresting. But there's a new person here, a dude. Uh, his name is looks like it's spelled Ralph, but we find out that it's pronounced Rafe, like Rafe Fines. Um, it was more than a year before Christopher discovered it was the name he read as Ralph. Uncle Ralph took his fancy complete, uh, took, took his fancy completely. To begin with, he was smoking a cigar. 
The scents of the dressing room were changed and mixed with the rich incense-like smoke, and Mama was not protesting by even so much as sniffing. That enough was en that was enough to show that Uncle Rafe was in a class by himself. Then he was wearing tweeds, strong and tangy and almost fox-colored, which were a little baggy here and there, but blended beautifully with the darker foxiness of Uncle Ralph's hair and the redder foxiness of his mustache. Christopher had seldom seen a man in tweeds, or without whiskers. As a final touch, Uncle Rafe smiled at him like sunlight on an autumn forest. It was such an engaging smile that Christopher's face broke into a return smile almost of its own accord. "'Hello, old chap,' said Uncle Rafe, rolling out blue smoke above Mama's glossy hair. "'I know this is not the best way for an uncle to recommend himself to a nephew, but I've been sorting the family affairs out, and I'm afraid I've had, I've had to do one or two quite shocking things, like bringing you a new governess and arranging for you to start school in the autumn.' "'Governess over there, Miss Bell. I hope you like one another. Enough to forgive me, anyway.' "'So, this whole thing is really interesting, because initially, at this point, I'm assuming that his mother is aware that he has, and by he I mean Rafe, not Christopher, that Rafe has some sort of designs on her son.' It doesn't seem like she's aware of it, though. It's almost like she's just assuming that he's doing this because he cares about family and that's it. But, I mean, I, I'm immediately suspicious of this guy, in part because of the fact that he's so friendly in this, like, really overly familiar way immediately. And I'm also, it's Diana Wynne-Jones. And when there's a very friendly adult, oftentimes they are up to no good, let's be honest. Um, And... When his mother says that Miss Bell will hopefully be his last governess, that fixes it, fixes it in his mind. And forever after, he calls her the last governess, like even in the story. Um, so there's this interesting thing with this hidden prettiness that like any time that this governess shows any sort of emotional response to anything, it's like her face lights up a little bit more than it had been. And almost like she has to sort of like work to keep herself looking drab and unassuming. And I'm wondering about that because I, I think that maybe there's like a, like she, the governess has some sort of power of her own and maybe she's aware that his mother will not take kindly to a woman who's like any sort of competition. And so is making herself look less attractive in order to avoid threatening his mom but I could be completely off base there. It's just an interesting thing that it keeps coming up. Um, so he tries because he likes uncle Rafe so much to like the governess, but she's really kind of a drag and he can't seem to do it. And finally one day they're, they're playing around and he brings out this like, you know, set of bells that he got from one of the anywheres and she notices that it's very unusual and gets his attention. And she tries to quiz him about where he got it and is obviously unsatisfied with the responses that she gets. And finally, she goes to the mistress of the house and is like, we're going to need to talk to your brother. And he's crying at this point because Christopher she has the the governess has made it sound like she thinks Christopher stole the stuff that he was fairly given and of course there's no proving where he got it from and I was real mad at her for the way she decided to handle this by like scaring this child because I really don't know why she felt the need to handle it that way rather than just being like this is weird let me talk to your uncle about it she could have just been cool, but instead she decides to scare this poor child half to death by accusing him of theft and going and like reporting him to his mom initially. Um, so mama use, uses a little bit of her own hair to summon her brother through the mirror. Like they do a little bit of a FaceTime. And then a few seconds later, he just comes walking in through the door and he 
is very excited when he sees this toy and realizes that this is made of an alloy that we do not have here. This whole thing is an unfamiliar artifact. Um, and he, he starts to question Christopher pretty closely about how he manages to travel around and like whether or not, um, like how many things he's able to bring back. The fact that he can bring things back at all is like really impressive. Um, and just goes step by step with explaining to him exactly how he does this. And he says, I can always trust my hunches. Something had to come out of a heredity like this. By Jove, Christopher, old chap, you must be the only person in the world who can bring back solid objects from a spirit trip. I doubt if even old DeWitt can do that. Christopher glowed to find Uncle Ralph so pleased with him, but he could not help feeling resentful about the last governess. She said, she said I stole them. Take no notice of her. Women are always jumping to the wrong conclusions, Uncle Rafe said, lighting a cigar. At this, the last governess shrugged her shoulders up and smiled a little. The hidden prettiness came out stronger than Christopher had ever seen it, almost as if she was human and sharing a joke. Uncle Rafe blew a roll of blue smoke over them both, beaming like the sun coming through clouds. So weird. I really want to know what that's about. Like, I don't know, it feels significant to me. It might be nothing, or, like, maybe once it's revealed, I'm going to be like, oh, that's really not anything that I care that much about. But as of right now, I'm, like, dying to know what that means. Um, so he tells him, tomorrow I want to do an experiment and I want you to go into the place between and see if you can find a friend of mine who I'm going to send there to meet with you. And of course, Christopher who wants nothing more than to please uncle Rafe is like, Oh yeah, fuck yeah, I'll do that. Absolutely. Just, you know, let's, let's do it tonight. And Rafe is like, no, 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 I need time to get set up and everything. We're going to do it another day. Um, and he also tells Christopher to not say anything to his mother about this whole thing. So that was really the moment because like, like I said, initially when his uncle appears and he's hanging out with his mother and the new governess, I figured that his mother had to be aware that this woman who his uncle is directing to be in this kid's life. I figured she had to realize that, that the uncle had some sort of vested interest in her kid. But at this moment when he's like, Oh, and don't tell your mom, that's when I started to be like, Oh, okay. So this whole thing is not really what I thought. Um, so then chapter three, he manages to meet this other person in the place between really quickly. And the other guy is having a very different experience to Christopher because Christopher is solid. Um, when he's walking in the place between, he gets muddy and wet. When he goes into the other anywheres, he gets hot or cold, depending. He can eat things and touch things and taste things, and it's just a totally full body experience. But it turns out that the other guy, his uh, he goes by the name Tacroy. He comes through as like a spirit sort of thing. So he is insubstantial and doesn't get wet and and doesn't suffer like the uh, the discomfort of the cold and the heat. But downside is major being that he can't touch things. He can't taste things. He can't pick things up and certainly can't bring them back with him, which the fact that Christopher can do that is a huge deal. So. They head out into um, one of, and this is really interesting to me, is that Tacroy is saying something about how, like, well, you know, because there's 12 other worlds, and Christopher's like, 12? What? There's, like, way more than 12. What are you even talking about? And uh, he doesn't say that because he just kind of, you get the sense that he's trying so hard to be agreeable here that he doesn't really want to get into it and, like, you know, second guess this guy, but it's obvious that Christopher's ability to go in between these worlds and to discover them is so much more comprehensive than anybody before him that he's able to see entire like sections of this 
this in-between and these anywheres that nobody else has ever been able to see before. So I think that is really wild. And Takroy is only able to get here by doing this like intense trance. And there is a woman that's in the room with him playing on a harp because you need that sort of uh, anchor to your own world if you are doing this the way that he does it. So it's a really, um, it's a, an interesting sort of change in, in how much effort and how much ritual has to go into the thing. He winds up like kind of scaring her and she doesn't want to come back. So he has to get somebody else later. And when they don't play as well as she did, it actually affects how well he's able to come through, which I thought was fascinating. And he, uh, here is like, he, I don't think he even realized that coming through completely solid, the way that Christopher is, was even possible. I don't think he knew this was an option. I think he thought the way he does it is simply the way that people can do it. That's all that you get. And meeting somebody who is able to not only be solid themselves, but then later on, Christopher touches him and is able to solidify him as well. That's a whole other thing. That's a big deal. Christopher can allow this, but, but he can't undo it, or at least we haven't seen him undo it yet. So when later on he's trying to get through a wall and it would be really handy for him to only be spirit, like he can't do it. And that's very inconvenient. So they head into this, uh, this area that's really, really warm. Um, and I'm going to read this. This is one of the first anywheres Christopher had been to. He remembered it hotter and wetter. The big trees had been bright green and dripping. Now they seemed brown and a bit wilted as far as he could tell in the pink light. When he followed to Croy onto the crazily built wooden veranda of the inn, he saw that the blobs of colored fungus that had fascinated him last time had all turned dry and white. He wondered if the landlord would remember him. Um, so the landlord comes out and is like, won't you come inside out of this bitter weather? This is the coldest winter anyone's known for years, to which they're both like, uh, no, we're fine. Thanks. Um, and he hands Christopher something to bring back. He says, your uncle seems to have a lot of dealings here. That was why it was easy to set the experiment up. If it works, I think he's planning a whole set of trips all along the related worlds. You'd find that a bit boring, wouldn't you? Oh, no, I'd like it, Christopher said. How many are there after nine? Ours is twelve, said Tacroy. Then they go down to one along the other way. Don't ask me why they go back to front. It's traditional. Christopher frowned over this. There were a great many more valleys in, uh, there were a great many more valleys than that in the place between, all arranged higgledy piggledy too, not in any neat way that made you need to count to twelve. But he supposed there must be some way in which Tacroy knew best, or Uncle Ralph did. The landlord shuffled hastily out again. He was carrying two cups that steamed out a dark chocolate smell, although this lovely aroma was rather spoiled by a much less pleasant smell coming from a round leather container on a long strap, which he dumped on the table beside the cups. Here we are, he said. That's the package, and here's to take the chill off you and drink to further dealing, sir. I don't know how you two can stand it out here. So it turns out, we find out later, that this shit is fucking dragon blood. This is expensive. It's a whole bottle of it, too. Like, this is a lot. So, uh, this is our first inkling, especially if you've read Charmed Life, at knowing that his uncle is probably up to no good. Because using dragon's blood is, like, really, really dangerous and usually used to do kind of, like, harmful magic. Um, and to Croy at this point is like talking to Christopher and asking him questions about different things that he may have tried and experimented with on his own and asks whether or not he's able to bring back something alive. And Christopher asks maybe a mouse that I could just put in my pocket. A sudden gleeful look came into Decroy's face. He looked, Christopher thought like a person about to be thoroughly naughty. 
Let's try it, he said. Let's see if you can bring back a small animal next. I'll persuade your uncle that we need to know that. I think I'll die of curiosity if we don't try it, even if it's the last thing you do for us. After that, Tacroy seemed to get more and more impatient. At last, he stood up in such a hurry that he stood right through the chair as if it wasn't there. Haven't you finished yet? Let's get going. Um, so, Christopher gets up and he's thinking that maybe they will uh, go and check out the town. He can show him some of the different places that he's been already. But DeCroix stops him and is like, where are you going? And he's like, I was going to give you the tour, basically. And DeCroix is like, no, dude, I'm sorry. But I have been having a hard enough time holding this trance. And I definitely can't do this anymore. And certainly not enough for a tour of the entire town. So... We're going to need to go back and I need to be to keep an eye on you and make sure that you also came back and that everything was OK, because obviously that's part of the deal with the uncle. And he does. Um, and the this is when Tacroy finds out that Christopher can make him more solid because he's sort of starting to like dissipate almost. Um, what did you do? Hardened you up, Christopher said. You needed it so that we could go and look at the town. Come on. But Tacroy laughed and took a firm grip on Christopher's arm, so firm that Christopher was sorry he had hardened him. No, we'll see the fungus another time. Now I know you can do this too. It's going to be much easier. But I only contracted for an hour this trip. Come on. Um, and Tacroy mentions something about how he can like almost see what's around him, but he can definitely hear it when he hadn't before. So because a lot of things had been just sort of like vague outlines. Um, Christopher wondered whether to go back into nine or into another valley, but it did not seem such fun without company. So he let the place between push him back home. Um, I would hazard to say that I bet at one point you are going to find it is not so much fun with company, sir. So the next morning he wakes up and that friggin' bottle of dragon's blood is sitting there and the governess is really like startled at the fact that he has something so dangerous, just chilling in his bed with him. And it says Christopher blinked up at her. He had never seen her so emotional. All her hidden prettiness had come out, and she was staring at the bottle as if, she, as if she did not know whether to be angry or scared or pleased. What's in it? he said. Dragon's blood, and it's not even dried. I'm going to get this straight off to your uncle while you get dressed or your mama will throw fits. I think your uncle's going to be very pleased. So, at this point, he gets a huge box of chocolates from his uncle for his good job, and a gold sovereign and a card. And Christopher is just about on cloud nine. He is so delighted that he has pleased his uncle like this. It's like, it's really sweet, but also super sad. You know, like you're just like, oh, kid, you deserve better than this. Um, and his mother says, um, when he offers her some of the chocolates, you do seem to have taken your uncle's fancy. And that's just as well, since I've had to put all my money in his hands. It'll be your money one day, she said as her fingers closed on the fudge. Uh, that sounds like a bad idea, since I've had to put all my money in his hands. Really? It's going to be your money one day? Is it? Is it? Because I feel like your brother is scheming to do something that is going to keep that money from being anybody but his. Hmm, don't care for it. Um, it was clear that Mama did not have the least suspicion what the chocolates were really about. Christopher was pleased to have been so faithful to Uncle Rafe's wishes, though he did wish Mama had not chosen the fudge. The rest of the chocolates did not quite last the whole week, but they did take Christopher's mind off the excitement of the next experiment. In fact, when the last governess said calmly the next Friday before bedtime, Your uncle wants you to go on another dream tonight. Christopher felt more businesslike than excited. You're try to, you are to try to get to series 10, said the last governess, and meet the same man as before. Do you think you can do that? Easy, Christopher said loftily. I could do it standing on my head. Which is getting a little swelled, remarked the last governess.
Don't forget to brush your hair and clean your teeth and don't get too confident. This is not really a game. Um, Christopher did honestly try not to feel too confident, but it was easy. He went out onto the path where he put his put on his muddy clothes, then climbed through the place between looking for Tacroy. So he finally gets to finds Tacroy, who is frustrated because the woman who is playing the flute is not nearly as good as the one that had been playing the harp. And they go into the world where Christopher had previously gotten all of those bells. Um, and apparently there's this thing that his uncle tried to send them a horseless carriage, a car to drive, but it doesn't work for whatever reason. It's just sort of this like insubstantial cloud that they can't tell what it is. The only reason that we know it's supposed to be a car is because that was what was intended, but it doesn't work at all. And they were hoping that maybe Christopher would be able to like put his hands on it and make it solid, but that doesn't do anything. Um, so they have to write a big 10 in the dirt of the path. And I like that too. I had forgotten to mention it, that to Croy is like, you need to make a mark so that you know where you've come in and out of. And that's never, ever been a problem for Christopher. He's like, well, how can I possibly forget? It's really easy to remember. This is the one that yada, yada, yada. Like he knows from the look of a place exactly which one he came out of and where he's going again. Like it's all so intuitive to him that this like really organized method of ex exploration just doesn't feel necessary to him at all. Um, and... We, let's see. Oh, yeah, here it is. So they finally get to this uh, wall that it turns out his uncle really wants Christopher to bring back a cat from one of the temples in this world. And Christopher is just kind of like, yeah, I can do that. No problem. That's fine. They're not really... You know, for right now, what we know of Christopher, it makes sense that he thinks this is going to be really simple because he has been able to bring all kinds of things back before. And he ha it hasn't worked on an animal, but it doesn't sound like he's ever even tried an animal. So there's a certain amount of confidence, I think, that he has that this is going to work fine. Like, I haven't tried it, but I'm sure it's going to, you know, I'm sure that'll work. Well... They try to get through this wall because the, one of the, the temples are all guarded by these walls. But unfortunately, being made solid works against uh, Tukroy here because he is unable to get through this wall. And he knows that Christopher is also solid and so sort of assumes that Christopher won't be able to do this either. But surprise, surprise, Christo Christopher is able to like basically sidle his way past the wall, like gets through it later on when he tries to come out again and he has the cat with him, it does not work. But as of right now, this is all going better than they could have expected. So he goes through the wall and there are a lot of cats in here, lots of them. And it turns out that, there is a sort of a priestess is the wrong word. There is a sort of like human um, representative of a goddess in this, uh, in this temple. And she is really bored with her job. Like she's able to do magic and do cool things that are like impressive and, and, but she doesn't hang out with anybody. She talks about how all the reading that she has is like holy books and stuff. That's like almost like textbook kind of stuff. There's nothing to read just for fun. And he asks something about how, like when, because she says the goddess is always supposed to be a young girl. And he asks, so when you grow up, do you stop being the representative? And she sort of like thinks about it and is like, huh, I don't know. I guess, that must be what happens. And I immediately, like my antenna went up and I was like, they are going to kill her when she gets too old. Doesn't, aren't they? Like, 
I'm not looking forward to this revelation. I have no reason to think that. It's just the sort of like the fact that nobody said to her, oh, yeah, we've got a retirement package all set for you after this is over. I feel like that's a bad, ugh, you know, a bad sign, a red flag. Um, I was chosen from among all the other applicants because I'm the best vessel for her power. A chef picked me out by giving me the mark of a cat upon my foot. Look. She tipped herself sideways on her cushions and stretched one bare foot with an anklet around it towards Christopher. It had a big purple birthmark on the sole. Christopher did not think it looked much like a cat, even when he screwed his eyes up so much that he felt like to croy. "'You don't believe me,' the goddess said, rather accusingly. "'I don't know,' said Christopher. "'I've never met a goddess before. What do you do?' I stay in the temple unseen except for one day every year when I ride to the city and bless it. Christopher thought that this did not sound very interesting, but before he could say so, the goddess added, It's not much fun, actually, but that's the way things are when you're honored, like I am. But living a sheth always has to be a young girl, you see. Um, so, he just straight up tells her. He doesn't try and beat around the bush. He doesn't try to be, like, coy about it. He's just like... So, uh, my uncle really wants me to take one of these cats back with me. And she's like, well, these cats, like, first of all, you're not taking that cat. That's my cat. Secondly, all of these cats belong to a sheth, so I don't really see you getting out of here with any of these. However, I might see to making an exception if you will agree to do something for me. And he very foolishly, I think, swears that he'll do it without actually getting a straight answer out of her of what she wants. But it turns out to not actually be a big deal. What he what she wants is books in exchange for one of the cats. And because she's so bored, she just needs something to fucking do. So they agree and they go to track down this cat called Throgmorton, who is a ginger. And Throgmorton is a huge bully. Um, and she's like excited actually to just get rid of this particular cat. Um, he smells and he scratches and he bullies all the other cats. I hate him, but we'll have to be quick about catching him. So they manage finally to get Throgmorton. It takes him like this cat tries to run away up the wall. She uses her powers to like throw him right into a basket. But uh, it's like, tough for them to actually get it closed and this cat gets a couple of good scratches on them while they're packing it up and there's a moment that i highlighted throgmorton was christopher had to admit a truly unpleasant cat his yellow eyes stared at them with a blank and insolent leer and there was something about the set of his ears one higher than the other which told christopher that throgmorton would attack viciously anything that got in his way this being so, he was puzzled that Throgmorton should remind him remarkably much of Uncle Rafe. He supposed it must be the gingerness. Yeah, no, it's not the gingerness, buddy. It's that Rafe's a predator and a terrible person, and you can just sort of see that somewhere under the surface, but you just don't know enough to be able to tell exactly what that is yet, but you will at some point. So... They capture this cat, he tries to go through the wall, it doesn't work, and he has to go the long way around. And as he does this, the cat decides to put up a fuss and makes this crazy noise, and one of the guards spots him trying to run off with a temple cat and chucks a spear at him, and it goes right through his chest. And there's a moment where I'm like, maybe it didn't really do it, but he's like bleeding. And I feel like that means that this shit really happened, which I think means that he just lost one of his nine lives. And that's might be like the first reveal of his life that he has an additional life to spare any additional lives. Um, but yeah, so that's a pretty big deal. We will see, I guess, what happens from there. But I sure wasn't expecting him to just get stabbed in the fucking heart. So surprise, bitch. Good Lord. Um, so, yeah, I this was really, really fun. And what a weird like I'm really excited to be back in the general world. 
but not in at all a similar story. Um, this is just a, a fun, like, series of uh, comforting familiarity and also, like, subversion of expectations that I'm just, I'm really here for it. So um, many, many thanks again to Patricia for commissioning this. I'm excited. And... Oh, she wrote. Some, I'm sorry, Patricia. I had the app open for the Kindle, and I didn't see that you wrote something. Um, well, he did call out the chef. Oh, you're talking about the letter that his dad wrote, and why the why the uh, servants always leave. Yeah, I guess that's true. He says that that she, that laundress was lazy, and the chef is terrible. So yeah, you're right. That makes sense. That they would all just be like, okay, well then, fuck you. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you all for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the coverage and I will be seeing you again soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers.